previously. Previously, we discussed rotational motion of molecules and we said that whenever molecules move, they rotate and as a result of that rotation, there can be a change in rotational energy of the molecule and if the change in rotational energy is high enough, electrons within that molecule can transition from a ground state to an excited state. Now, rotational energy or change in rotational energy is not the only thing that can lead to a molecular electron transition. Remember, molecules not only rotate, but they can also vibrate. And if there is a change in vibrational energy that is high enough, an electron can transition as we'll see in this lecture. So in this lecture, we're going to focus on the vibrational energy of molecules and how that can lead to electron transitions. So let's begin by remembering that whenever two atoms combine, they form a molecule and generally speaking, the molecule is lower in energy and more stable than the sum of the energies of the constituent atoms. And that's because when atoms combine, their electron probability densities, their electron clouds also combine, they overlap and that increases the volume in which the electrons, the outer electrons of our atoms can be found in. And this increase in volume by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle means that the electrons have a smaller momentum and so they have a smaller energy. And if the electrons have a smaller energy, the atom is lower in energy or the molecule is lower in energy and that that means the molecule is more stable than its constituent atoms. So that's exactly why molecules form in the first place. Atoms combine to form molecules because molecules are lower in energy and more stable than our individual constituent atoms. Now, let's recall what our potential energy diagram for the formation of our molecule actually looks like. So basically, when our two atoms combine to form our molecule, they form a chemical bond, a overlap of atomic orbitals, of electron clouds. And so, as our separation distance between our two atoms decreases, so the separation distance is given by the x-axis and the potential energy u is given by the y-axis as it decreases to a certain optimum value given by r naught. that quantity corresponds to the lowest possible energy state of our molecule. So the r naught value represents the separation distance between the two atoms in the molecule when the molecule is in its lower in energy and most stable state. So that is given by this quantity here. Now, remember, the electrons, the protons, and the neutrons of the atom are not stationary. In fact, they're in a constant state of motion. Remember, according to quantum mechanics, electrons are never stationary. They're always fluctuating, and their electron clouds are always fluctuating. And that means the separation distance between our two atoms is not always the same value. So under typical conditions, the molecule oscillates between a separation values that are very close to R0. So basically, our separation distance R0 isn't always R0, but it instead oscillates back and forth between some very small values close to R0. Now, if we only examine this curve, we get the following result. So basically, there's a very high probability probability that our separation distance of our molecule is within this region. While there is a very low probability that the separation distance between our two atoms is in this region or in this region. So this is the most likely separation distance within our diatomic molecule. 
Now, what exactly does this curve actually tell us? Well, notice that our distance oscillates back and forth, and this kind of looks like simple harmonic motion that we discussed when we spoke about wave motion. So we see that the curve closely resembles the potential energy curve of simple harmonic oscillators. So this means that the small displacements around R0, that for small displacements around R0, our molecule actually behaves as a simple harmonic oscillator. Now recall that the frequency of oscillation of any simple harmonic oscillator is given by this equation. So we can use this equation to calculate the number of oscillations our molecule makes every single second. So the frequency given by f is equal to 1 divided by 2 pi multiplied by the square root of k divided by mu. Now in this particular case k is the stiffness constant but mu is the reduced mass. So the reduced mass is equal to m1 multiplied by m2 divided by m plus m1 plus m2 where m1 is the mass of atom 1 and m2 is the mass of atom 2 inside our diatomic molecule. Now, in the same way that when we discussed finite potential wells, we were able to use Schrodinger's equation to solve for the energy, we can also use Schrodinger's equation to obtain the energy of vibra- <coughs> Excuse me the energy of vibration. So we're not going to go through the specifics of solving Schrodinger's equation, we're simply going to show you the end result. So the energy or the vibrational energy of our molecule is given by this equation. So our E is equal to H multiplied by F multiplied by V plus one half. Now H is Planck's constant, F is the frequency that can be obtained via this equation and V is the vibrational quantum number, which is basically a value that begins with zero and increases by increments of one. So V can be zero, one, two, three, and four. It basically tells us which quantum state our electron is found in. So basically this equation gives us the vibrational energy of our molecule as a result of its oscillation around this value of R0. So we see that the energy depends on the frequency as well as our vibrational quantum number. But even for a quantum number of V equals zero, which is the ground state, we still have a certain vibrational energy that is given by this this quantity. So if V is equal to 1, then E simply is HF divided by 2. And this is known as the zero potential energy. Now recall in our discussion on rotational energy, we saw that when the quantum state was zero, our energy was also zero. But for a quantum state of zero, the vibrational energy is not zero, but rather it's given by this quantity. Now, whenever electrons undergo transitions in quantum mechanics, we have to use a set of rules known as the selection rules to actually determine which transitions are allowed and which transitions are forbidden. So the selection rule of quantum mechanical electron transition states that the change in our quantum number, in this case the vibrational quantum number V, can only be positive 1 or negative 1. So our electron can never jump from let's say V equals 0 to V equals 5 because the delta V would be greater than positive or negative 1. So that means if initially the electron is found in a vibrational quantum state of V, then the final V must either be V plus 1 or V minus 1. So let's suppose our V1 is V and our V2 is V plus 1. So we can use this equation to calculate the change in vibrational energy delta E vibrational by simply plugging in V for one of them and V plus 1 for the second one. So we subtract those, we get the following result. 
So we have a constant. We can take that out of our equation HF and we multiply by V plus one half minus V uh, plus one multiply uh, plus this. So we have V plus three halves which comes from V plus one plus one half minus so we have V so it's simply V minus one half when we distribute our negative sign. So we see that the V's cancel. We add these two quantities and that gives us a one. So HF multiplied by one is simply HF. So we see that the change in vibrational energies within molecules when electrons transition between two quantum states is given by this quantity. So basically as a result of the vibrational motion, as a result of the oscillation of our molecule, that molecule can undergo a change in vibrational energy and that can basically lead to an electron transition. And